Hello there and welcome to this damn fool idealistic crusade. This is going to be a first in what I hope turns out to be a, a series of film commentaries. This will basically be me just watching or re-watching a favorite and just kind of spouting off various factoids, trivia pieces, and whatever comes to mind. Uh, basically kind of my thought process or whatever pops up in my head when I'm re-watching a, a cherished favorite or a movie I know a lot about um, because I know my own head is not very quiet when I'm re-watching a title. So I decided to go with a film I know quite a bit about in terms of its uh, production history, backstories, and a film I'm always fascinated with learning more about. Um, and that, of course, is the original 1989 Batman uh, which was the first of the four uh, Bat films that uh, culminated in 97's Batman and Robin. And if you look at the production history of all four of these films, uh, it's just a, a wealth, a treasure trove of uh, film information and a great way to learn about how movies are brought to the screen and produced and all of the failed attempts to get it off the ground. It took Michael Usan, um you know, roughly 10 plus years to get this film made. Uh, you know, he got laughed at and thrown out of practically every studio office uh, trying to sell a dark, serious Batman adaptation. Nobody believed in it. Um, so I would recommend checking out his book, uh, The Boy Who Loved Batman, uh, which is a great uh, autobiography and goes into a bit of that, uh, you know, 10 year struggle to get this film made. And I would also recommend checking out, if you haven't already, the excellent uh, Shadows of the Bat documentary series that is on the 2005 uh, DVD releases, been ported over to the Blu-rays and the uh, 4K UHD release as well. And then lastly, I would also say um, definitely also check out the Craig Shaw Gardner novelization of the film, which has a few little deleted bits that are not in the final film and some extra character nuance and some extra internal monologues of the various characters, which I found very rewarding. And usually when I rewatch the film, I reread the novelization because it's it's a really fun read. It's a very quick read. You can usually pick up a copy. Um, you can usually find them in local comic shops even, uh, usually just, you know, a little dog-geared paperback copy for a buck or two. Um, so I'd recommend those. And... Um, if you're really interested, maybe take a deep dive into the earlier script drafts of the film, uh, particularly the uh, original Sam Hamm draft of the film. And then, of course, he was replaced by Warren Skarin, who came in and did uh, on-set rewrites. Uh, Sam Hamm was prevented from doing so due to the Writers Guild strike. And uh, his original fil uh, film script that they, uh, you know, were were shooting on you know what they what they went to actually go and shoot is uh, remarkably different from what we got in the final film there are a lot of little differences a lot of big differences and I think it's a very rewarding experience to read his original the Batman script and uh, some of the drafts are floating around online I don't know if all of them are um, but I, I've read uh, at least two different drafts and then uh, you can then appreciate the differences that came in, uh, what Warren Skarin brought to the table, uh, you know, and then Tim Burton's influence and the producer's influence and the studio's influence. So there, anyway, there's there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen on Batman 89, which is a point I'm going to probably bring up a lot in this commentary. Um, I'd also recommend checking out, if you can find it, the original uh, 1982, 1983, but uh, I'm not sure about the exact year, but it's from the early 80s, but the original uh, draft written by Tom Mankiewicz, the great writer of Superman and the, um, the three James Bond films of the 1970s, uh, who I'm a great admirer of. Uh, he was consulted and wrote the original drafts that then uh, Michael Uslan kind of shopped around to the various studios. And that was the draft that Sam Hamm and Tim Burton had to kind of play with in about, you know, the mid 80s or about 86, 87, 88. Um, you know, that was the one that had been kicked around a lot and, and used to, uh, you know, shop the project around, but it never really gotten anywhere. But it's an interesting read and it's actually a great you know, a, a pretty good screenplay. Uh, I would say the only thing to kind of, you know, label against is maybe it feels a bit too much like the uh, feeling and some of the structure of Superman the movie, which of course makes sense because, you know, Tom Manko is basically <laughs> is the heart of the story of Superman 1 and 2, uh, even though he only got the script consultant credit. You know, it's it's pretty pretty much well known that, you know, he had to go in and 
do all the all the rewriting and restructuring after the Mario Puzo uh, mammoth draft, and then uh, the um, all the rewriting by the Newmans and others. So um, it, it would make sense that it, it shared a lot of similarities with Superman, but I still think it it, it would would have worked, uh, you know. And you could picture an early '80s Batman film long before Batman '89. So I would suggest you know check out some of those sources if you haven't before. I will link in the description below. And uh, with that being said, I will be using the uh, 2005 uh, DVD just for, you know, the it's one that most people are going to have. So I figured that would be easy to, um, you know, you can grab your own copy of the film and, and try and do a rough sync. And again, this is it's, it's a work in progress. This is the first commentary I've tried. So you'll have to bear with me if it's if it's a little bit rough. Um, but uh, in a second, I'll try and give the uh, time code. So in that way we can all get on the same page and you can roughly kind of, uh, you know, be on the uh, same track with me. And again, this is just going to be a solo commentary. So it's just me all here by my lonesome self. So it's probably gonna be a little bit different from your, uh, you know, the typical uh, YouTube commentary you find where it's, uh, you know, a bunch of dudes having a great time. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, you or whoever stumbles across me blabbing on about Batman 89 will also have a good time. But uh, please do understand if there are, you know, any any gaps. Um, I may just have to get some water or catch my breath or something. Um, but again, this is just very loose, very informal, uh, very much in the manner that um, I think Sir Roger Moore put it best uh, in his James Bond commentaries where he said, uh, you know, picture it more like a, a conversation among friends, uh, but uh, unfortunately a one-sided conversation. Uh, so with that, uh, this is my attempt at doing a Batman 89 commentary. So grab whichever version you like, whether it be VHS with the Diet Coke commercial at the beginning, or the uh, wonderful Laserdisc, the uh, Flipper DVD, the Special Edition DVD, the Blu-ray, or even the UHD version, or uh, one on a streaming platform of your choice. And uh, go ahead and queue it up to the start point at uh, 0 minute 0 seconds, and press play. So we have the Warner Shield, and if you're looking at any of the earlier versions, uh, the opening titles always have some gate weave. Uh, that pretty much stayed until the um, UHD release. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of me making technical notes. But anyway, here we have the iconic opening title with the first strains of Danny Elfman's iconic Batman theme. And one can only imagine being in the theater in 1989, particularly as a Batman fan, and feeling the the rumblings coming through and being like, oh man, I think we might be in for something actually amazing. And then we go into the darkness and for the main title card, the theme swells up. And uh, if you're listening to the older copies, the uh, the original mix of the film really swells there. I really love the, um, the sound design of this film. It's not talked about very often, but um, on the older video releases, it has a slight uh, bassier feel to it, and you really get it in that uh, opening title moment, um, especially if you have a really good home theater setup. But uh, I, I really still enjoy running the laser disc and the uh, first DVD because it's just a heavier mix to it. Uh, from the 2005 DVD onward, it, it kind of got, uh, well, not really tinnier, but it definitely sounds a little bit different. Um, and then, of course, the UHD release, unfortunately, was a brand new Atmos mix that uh, replaced all the original sound effects, which I'll probably mention some more, but I really can't stand that. Um, so anyway, we see the cast of characters that, uh, you know, comprise all of the all of the wonderful, interesting qualities and quirks of this film. Uh, a lot of people aren't talked about very much, but of course, you have to mention Anton First, whose vision of Gotham City was really uh, nothing anybody had seen before. But wouldn't have been anything without Roger Pratt's cinematography, which really helped to, you know, make this wonderful set come to life. Um, uh, just trying to keep up with all the names. And, of course, you have uh, Mike Guslin and uh, Benjamin Melnicker, who, you know, fought tooth and nail to get this film made. So getting their credit on the screen must have been vindication. Uh, here we have the screenplay credit, as mentioned before, originally by Sam Hamm, uh, with Warren Scarron's involvement. Then the super producers of Peter and Goober, and of course, directed by Tim Burton. And then we go 
for this great final flourish, which is really dramatic, and then fades off in the darkness, and you have the first vision of Gotham City, as if hell itself had erupted from the ground and kept growing, which is, I mean, trying to remember the exact line from the uh, Sam Ham original script. I always love the moment where the siren kind of transitions into the closer shots, because you still heard the siren going. Um, again, there's a lot of interesting little sound design bits here and there. Here we have a, uh, a couple and young child, which you know kind of sets it up as, "Hey, is this? Are these the Waynes?" But of course, very quickly, it's kind of revealed that it's not the Waynes. But if you were not aware of Batman outside of going into this movie cold, uh, you might think that this is going to be the origin of Batman. But it does have that interesting linkage to it that kind of sets it up. You know, this is why Batman is around, so bad things won't happen to more, uh, you know couple with child <laughs> uh, and of course we're being introduced to Gotham City we're introduced to all of the Denzians of course uh, things we're going to see a million times like the Monarch Theater and the taxi cabs always love the bit of the <laughs> lady of the night uh, looking at the, the little boy and then <laughs> just them jerking him away um, and of course we have now stepped off into the darkness and here you can see how the production design has gone to really intricate details. It's not just the sets, but it's the costumes. Everybody sort of has that grubby makeup on them. Um, lots of fog, lots of lots of shadow. I should mention here that most of the home video versions have been brightened. Uh, originally, both this and Batman Returns were very, very dark. If you get to see it uh, on an original print, uh, the 4K releases do kind of bring a lot of that back. Um, they have some issues of their own in color, but it's a lot better in terms of the darkness. So if you ever thought these two films kind of look stagey, that's why they're not supposed to be this bright. Um, so here we have the mugging, and then here we have our first glimpse of Batman. And I always love this bit here as he turns away. The, the shadow's been animated, so you see the little ears, and it gives it a very much uh, of a vibe of you know, like a horror film or maybe German Expressionism. And that's that's definitely probably the first very Tim Burton-y flourish, uh, which I think is where most of his style comes up. It's these little flourishes, but it's all around the narrative drive from the original uh, Sam Hamm draft and then, you know, uh, Warren Skarin as well. So Batman 89 does have, you know, a pretty good story narrative drive to it. Uh, whereas a lot of people will say that Batman Returns doesn't, and I can understand that criticism. Uh, here you see the the makeup that they've got on these guys. They they kind of have this real scuzzy look to them. Again, to give credence to the idea that you know the Denzians of Gotham City, you know, they live in this horrible metropolis, so even their faces look terrible. And here we have the first entrance of Batman. Set up, again, with the elements of German German Expressionism and of, you know, of it being like a horror film. And that plays into the idea of this Batman being up the shadows and trying to promote that he is a creature of the night and cannot be stopped, which is also what this whole first fight is about. So, and this is right out of a horror movie. And, of course, it's very effective. I always love how his eyes kind of flare out in the light there. And then here is your straight horror vibe where he's been shot multiple times and then at point blank range then gets up like he is an unstoppable demon and you have the wings and everything. But then here when he puts him down, he's in pure fight mode. Again, seriousness of this. And then the first time you see the Batarang hooked to a line. I mean, this is just <laughs> catnip for uh, comic book fans. Again, the idea of vindication. And that shot there of Keaton in the suit, that close up is the first time you see the real just power behind the cowl here. Of course, we have the Nike product placement. <laughs> it doesn't get much more iconic than that. Um, it's really cool if you read the earlier drafts. There is no I'm Batman. If you read the novelization, he just says, you know, uh, the it's you don't know the you don't own the night, and then Batman just says, I am the night. Um, so it's unclear. It may have been Keaton or somebody on set added the I'm Batman, but it just seems obvious now in, in retrospect. Um, so here we have set up of more of the supporting characters who, you know, they don't get all that much to do here in 89, but at least they're there and they have more of a role than they do in some of the later films. 
Uh, but here we have the whole political subtext. We have the new government trying to take back the city from being corrupt. We have Commissioner Gordon, and we have uh, DA Harvey Dent, played by you know Billy D. Williams, with the idea that hopefully he would get to be Two Face later on, which unfortunately did not come to pass um, until the Lego Batman movie. Uh, it's a cute Easter egg. I also loved that this setup here uh, with the mics and everything, it is sort of a tilted angle, but it is semi-reminiscent in a way of Citizen Kane and the uh, political campaign sequences. That's just what I've always thought of. Uh, and here we have our first glimpse of Jack Napier, uh, pre-Joker stage. Uh, of course, the casting and nabbing of Jack Nicholson was the you know key redeeming factor in getting this film off the ground and getting it viewed with some level of respect, um, much in the way of getting Brando as Jor-El in Superman the movie. Uh, what's great about this is you get uh, Jack's character set up, you get the setup of the uh, secret illicit affair he's having with you know Grissom's girlfriend. That's of course going to get him fried later on. Uh, his disdain for the uh, for the establishment, for Grissom, for practically everything. Uh, you know, he cares about nothing. <laughs> and you don't even need any dialogue. You can just see it in Jack's face. This is one of those scenes where you can really see that, you know, it's not just Nicholson playing Nicholson. Like, it's it's often labeled. Um, you know, he really does bring a lot to this film. There's a lot of gravitas. There's a lot of weight. And he finds a lot of interesting... Um, not just deliveries, but uh, interesting little pieces like this look here, uh, little nuances in between the lines that enrich a lot of stuff. So I think there's a lot to be said for the Jack Napier stuff pre-Joker um, that you know often kind of gets overlooked. I love that little bit. This is an extra tiny little bit. There's some shots here that the editing gets held just a little bit longer, which is really nice because it gives you time to digest. Um, you know, it, it, does, it doesn't cut too fast, and you get some nice character beats because of that. And here we have our introduction. To, here we have our introduction to Eckhart, which is... A character, you know, corrupt cop, but seems very much modeled on the Bullock character. And here we have Alexander Knox, which is a character a lot of people have issues with, but I adore Robert Wool as Knox in this movie. And this is this is really from the Sam Hamm uh, script, which had a lot of 1930s elements. Knox is basically your 30s reporter. Uh, much as Vicki Vale was much more of a 30s reporter, and they had a whole dynamic in the uh, original ham drafts that was much more your His Girl Friday or front page newspaper men and women type scenario with, you know, sort of the screwball comedy and fast talking vibe, which coming from the 1930s really fits because, you know, this film has a setting that's not necessarily specific about what date it is. It's in between the 30s and the 80s, uh, which gives it a sort of Never Never Land uh, feeling to it. This is something the animated series also picked up on and would carried over into Batman Returns, even though the production design was a lot different. Um, Knox played a bigger role in the earlier drafts, but he's still like the uh, the audience's surrogate in this film and, and the, the final version he turned up as. But uh, I, I just really like the character. Uh, here we have Eckhart meeting Jack. This is a, a great little scene of nuance that on, on first glance doesn't add a whole, whole lot. Uh, but actually, it, it really, this is the scene where Jack basically sets up his own downfall. And uh, you can see the first real glimpses of, yeah, this, this dude has problems. <laughs> Even if it's just, you know, when he gets the crazy eye look. And here you get more of the corruption of Gotham and how, you know, Eckhart is supposedly a point man in this hierarchy of uh, Grissom's army. <laughs> and you hear Jack's glimpsing into, you know, this, this future he wants for himself where he's going to run the show. And here you can see Jack's eye start to, start to twitch as that, you know, inner psychoticness starts to come through. But undercut with that slight level of humor, and he has this little laugh here um, that, you know, foreshadows his jokerisms, basically. So the, the, this stuff is all already kind of there under the surface. 
And of course, you have <laughs> Bob the Coon, who is just a wonderful presence in this film, and you, you, you gotta love Bob. And then the key line, where you been spending your nights? I hope you don't mind. I'm probably gonna do a lot of line readings and impressions as this goes on. For some reason, I wind up quoting Batman 89 uh, more than most other films. I, I quote films a lot, but for some reason, Batman 89 is always in the back of my brain, and I quote it frequently, so go figure. Uh, here we have the, uh, you know, again, subtextual backstory of the uh, city trying to celebrate the anniversary, which sets up the parade at the end of the film. Uh, they don't really go all, a whole lot of places with it, but uh, that that is what sets up the Joker basically taking over the parade at the end. Uh, here we have the newsroom. This is really the scene where you get the whole 30s newspaperman screwball comedy type vibe with the faster dialogue. And in a lot of ways, I wish we'd gotten a little more of this, but it does kind of give you some extra character, extra flavor of this world. I do love the design of the office. And here we are introduced to Vicki Vale. Um, kind of similarly in a way to how we're introduced to Catherine Hepburn's character in Woman of the Year in the newspaper office when Spencer Tracy opens the door and the first thing he sees is a pair of legs. Um, so here we have Kim Basinger's Vicki Vale, who, of course, was a replacement for Sean Young who got injured while practicing for the horse riding sequence that was supposed to be the date of uh, Bruce and Vicky, which is why they're you know talking to Alfred, and Alfred's talking about um, him trying to give young Bruce a horse riding lesson, because originally they had just you know gotten off horses. Um, so uh, she was a last-minute replacement, because uh, they had already you know started production when uh, Sean Young got injured, so they had to find somebody really fast. Um, and, you know... All, all that considered, you know, at, at first, it doesn't seem like she's a great fit for this. Uh, but again, the, the character in the film is not, not you know, not all that there all the time. Uh, it's kind of comes across as being a little underwritten. And in the original ham drafts, uh, she was much more gutsy and two-fisted. And again, that sort of fast-talking 30s reporter gal, um, which I wish more, had, more of that had stayed. Uh, but over time, I think, yeah... It, she does give a good performance it is it is there but i think repeated viewings of this film really add a lot to it because from a storytelling perspective it's really really gutsy uh, there's a lot of subtext that's going on here and if if you're not going to you know give the film a chance it's it's going to seem like the prize is pretty simple and you're going to get all the jokes and like there's not a lot going on under the surface when there's enormous amounts of subtext going on under the surface and again i think this is one of the films that really rewards repeated viewings and digging into the production history because seeing this film five ten times reading the novelization it just adds to it uh, another thing that causes this uh the approach is to not really tell you anything about batman keep batman in mystery and uh, keep him in the shadows and set up the joker and show the joker's origin and over the course of Joker's origin and the rest of the film, you get more and more clues about Batman, more and more information is just doled out. So the mystery of the film is not who is the Joker and, you know, how is Batman going to stop? The mystery of the film is who is Batman? Why does Bruce Wayne do this? Bruce Wayne is an enigma in this film. It's very closed off. And in showing you how the Joker arises, it really is a really the same arc in a twisted sort of way to how Batman, uh, you know, how Batman begins, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, so it's it's a very bold approach to basically treat Batman himself like a mystery. And this is what I think leads to this and the sequels, you know, being labeled as, you know, having Batman as a supporting character in his own movie, um, which again, I can understand that, but I think, you know, people aren't taking a close enough look at, you know, what's being done here. And of course, it didn't help that the you know script was rewritten by other people, and there was the writer's strike, and you had all these different uh, voices with opinions and having to put their two cents in. Uh, because you had, it always gets labeled as Tim Burton's Batman, which is really not not quite true. The whole, um, that's but that's kind of linked more to um, auteurism. Uh, but here in 89, it's not really a Tim Burton movie. Uh, which is why he want, he uh, went into Batman Returns because the studio offered him full creative control. Here you have, you know, the original producers. You have Mel Nicker and Uslan, uh, but primarily you have, uh, you know, uh, Goober and Peters with 
a, a huge say in what's going on. You have Warner Brothers. You have Sam Hamm's original screenplay ideas. You have Warren Skarin coming in. You have Tim Burton's ideas he's trying to work in there. So the film kind of gets pushed and pulled in a bunch of different ways, um, which, you know, that some people might criticize that and say, you know, that's that's why it doesn't live up to its full potential all the time, which, you know, I, I, I completely agree with. But I think in a weird sort of way, that's kind of what makes 89 so special, uh, that you have a bunch of different voices and it's kind of getting pushed and pulled in, in different ways. Um, but but in some strange way, I think maybe because of, of Tim Burton's, you know, kind of quirkier view of, of things, that, that's kind of the glue that holds it together. And it, and it manages to work, um, which it really shouldn't have. So I think you have the, the original drive of the Sam Hamm story is still there, and that's what keeps the plot moving along. And then you have Tim Burton bringing in the horror elements and some of the casting choices, particularly Michael Gow and uh, Michael Keaton. Uh, and here we have the introduction of Bruce Wayne. And it's very innocuous, and I really like that. Um, and I love, the, I love the, the look in his eye. He has this sort of playfulness when he's talk, when, in his scenes with Vicky, but he's also that sort of distanced character but you can always see he's always focusing on something and of course you know leaving the practicalities of life <laughs> two sheets to the wind and of course alfred is there to back him up i love the staging of this and you get so much of bruce's character here a lot of people say oh he's just you know wandering around as michael keaton doing stuff that michael keaton might do but no everything is 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 done for a reason. It's got purpose, and it's all revealing of this characterization of Bruce Wayne, who is really, he is an enigma in this film, and in Batman Returns as well. Um, and I think a lot of people read that as being, you know, well, he doesn't do very much. He's more reactive. Um, but it's all, it's all, all his actions are very internalized, uh, I think would be the, the better way to explain it. And here we have Knox gate crashing and trying to squeeze in an interview with uh, Gordon and Dent, and I, I, I love I, I love this little bit. Uh, it's just believable enough. The dialogue has humor and quirks, and you get this little bit from Dent there, you know, where he's kind of smiling and actually has some character, and the mayor is just not having any of this because he's totally useless. <laughs> You kind of feel bad for Knox because he just he can't get a lead on this darn story. <laughs> Pulitzer Prize winning material. And of course, here we have the news about Eckhart. And I love Gordon's reaction. The oh my God. Um, also, I think here is another point where you can see the, the transfer's kind of been brightened up. Um, here we have the armory scene where uh, Knox and Vicky get kind of lost and find the arsenal. Um, I, I love their dialogue here. It feels very, very natural and everything. And, you know, it's like if uh, Bruce was going to collect stuff, maybe don't collect stuff that's going to seem like you are devoted to fighting or war. <laughs> but then again, you know, the rich are strange and collect all the weird stuff. I love how he's just wandering along the hallway and just happens to notice that, you know, two people broke into his... Uh, armor trophy room but but the way he he's walking behind them he's studying them he's kind of like following the their their conversation like he's he's always the outsider and you can see kind of kind of leans forward and he looks up at what they're pointing at and everything again there's always a lot of subtext here and he's got like a sort of half smile like he's disconnected from stuff and here we have the it's japanese but in japan i've used that too many times i have to admit in real life and here we have the three technically positive leads of the film finally meet, and you see Bruce Wayne's interaction with, uh, you know, the outside world and, and how this particular version of Bruce is going to, you know, put up the public front. And, you know, he seems very, very driven, uh, but he doesn't have the whole rich playboy thing like you uh, get in a lot of adaptations. Uh, he just just seems like an interesting guy who is kind of cut off from a lot of the world. And here we have the classic discussion about how many cases, what, uh, maybe six, six. Yeah. Yeah. Six, six is good. Yeah. It's kind of, kind of a fun little, little weird moment of awkwardness that kind of does feel realistic. There's a lot of little tiny things like that in this film that, you know, the more and more you rewatch it, it just gets stuck in my head. 
Uh, again, I've used that little bit of, a lot in real life for some reason. Uh, I do like the working end of the Corto Maltese, you know, which was basically name dropping Dark Knight Returns, which is the uh, that along with the Killing Joke and the whole um, resurrection of the comic book industry in the mid to late '80s in the public's mind. Uh, comics being taken more seriously, they could go into Warner Brothers and say, "Yeah, here's here's the proof. This is the serious stuff we're shooting for." Of course, you know they're they're not doing Miller and they're not doing. Uh, you know, Alan Moore, um, although Tim Burton did consult with Alan Moore on uh, during the pre-production of Batman, which is something a lot of people are not aware of. Uh, but, you know, they, they were serious about, you know, getting the serious Batman on the screen in some way, shape or form, which, again, that all goes back to uh, Mike Uslan and, you know, his... 10 plus year crusade to get it to the screen. So, you know, if anybody needs to, needs to be praised about, you know, getting this film made, you know, that's, that's, that's the person. Um, also, I think it should be said that there is, um, here you have the, uh, here again, the whole notion of Bruce being cut off from the outside world. He monitors his own house and that's how he's going to find out about why Gordon went away because he's just literally taping everyone like a, like a peeping Tom. Um, I love the design of, of the monitors and the compute, back computer setup. Again, it's that sort of weird crossover between 1930s and 1980s. Um, of course, ton of CRT monitors. We'll, we'll date it now, but for me, I see a CRT monitor and I get that nostalgic feel. Uh, but it has that sort of uh, metallic console. Again, the whole idea is it's like a weird hybrid of 1930s, 1940s, 1980s. You can't tell what decade it is. And I think this is maybe where the birth of the Bruce Wayne wears glasses at times kind of came from, um, because I don't know if that really kind of happened before. All right, so here we have the preparation for the Axis Chemicals shootout. And, of course, (laughs) it's all going to go horribly wrong. That's what happens when you put uh, corrupt cops in charge. Now, I haven't yet really mentioned the Elfman score. This is one of the first major cues that lets you know that this film has a real identity to it. Uh, you know, I think Danny Elfman picked up right on the stuff that Tim Burton was injecting into Batman. And this is one of my favorite cues, uh, this and the actual shootout. It's just this strange hybrid mix of... Uh, again, sort of 30s, 40s feeling, but it's not not a gangster movie score, but it's also got like a sort of wild zaniness to it. And here we have the the cue really getting into it as they sort of start to go out. And now back to the sound design, they put in all of these old timey gunshot effects. A lot of the old school 44 Magnum sound library effect you hear in hundreds of films. Uh, which, again, I think really lends to that sort of, you can't nail down what period this is. I love the sort of blending of times, and I think that does help the film really outlast being from the 1980s. It gives it a timeless quality. Um, It's really a shame that they remixed it in the Atmos mix and took all that out. All the modern effects just sound terrible. Um, They really messed around with the sound design because while this is not, you know, a sonic extravaganza, um, probably not the best mixed film of the year. Uh, technically, that would probably be Glory uh, from 1989, but uh, it's my favorite mix of 1989. Of course, I'm a sound geek too. I just I, I love a lot of the stuff they did. It's not you know very uh, you know top of the line technologically, but it's just uh, the the film's mix itself is kind of a character too, not just the music. I love the framing that they got in a lot of these hallways, which this was a very difficult location to shoot in because it was an actual, you know, old chemical facility. And here we have Batman's entrance, again, with these sort of expressionistic and horror vibes. And, of course, again, seeing this theatrically, all this would be a lot darker. Um, If you're watching the 4K version, it is properly a lot darker, so that is a, a nice change. Uh, it's the first time they've done a new transfer at Warner Brothers for the film in, you know, since 2005. Um, so here we have Jack trying to make his escape. And, uh, you know, pretty much everything that happens to Jack, what turns him into Joker, is all at his own hand. Because you see he is demolishing the chemical plant as an escape. But all this stuff sets up you know, the bath he's going to fall into. So again, I I like the whole comeuppance thing, Um, which also goes back to something that I like to think about. Um, 
most people complain that this kind of deviates from the comics because Batman kills people and all this stuff. Um, but, you know, Batman started out as a darker character, and I'm not the first to make this. Mike Usland says this a lot, but, you know, Batman 89 is a lot like the first year Batman stories of 1939 where, you know, Batman carries a gun and murders people and is very much like a, a complete knockoff of the shadow in a lot of ways. Um, you know, of course, the... A lot of the early drawings were uh, shadow knockoffs, and the first story Bill Finger admitted was, you know, a knockoff on a shadow story. Um, so in a lot of ways, you know, this is a lot like the shadow movie we've never quite gotten. And of course, ironically, this directly inspired the 1994 shadow film from Universal that uh, we got uh, because the influence of Batman is all over that. Um so there is a reason why, you know, this Batman is darker and doesn't have Robin. This is very much like a first-year Batman, a 1939 Batman, uh, which, again, makes me like the whole notion of blending times even more. So here we have... I love this moment. It plays out. It's held a little bit longer, and there's no dialogue, but they're just exchanging glances, and then Jack just kind of shakes it off and gives the nice outfit. And I love Keaton's look here. And then we have the first appearance of the Batman ninja style disappearance. <laughs> and you can see the confusion on Jack's face. It's not, not playing out as he intended, and he's kind of in over his head. And this, of course, is the moment where he literally could get away. But And then the camera kind of swirls, and you can see the wheels turning in his head. He's got to get it over on somebody and decides he's going to take out Eckhart because he's got to kill somebody. <laughs> And we have the payoff with the Think About the Future line. And Ninja Batman has reappeared. And here, the disfigurement on his face is all of Jack's own doing because, you know, Batman deflected the bullet with his gauntlets. But here, you can barely sort of see the beginning of the facial scars. That, and, of course, it's all at Jack's own doing. And Batman does try and save him, but, of course, you know, the glove prevents that. And, of course, he's already wearing the purple suit, which sets everything up. Um, the camera swirling and then this sort of moment where then the bubbles kind of disappear is, is a nice cap to this whole scene. It gives it some visual action, uh, so it's not just, you know, a guy falling into a vat. Um, and, of course, he disappears. And now Batman must escape, and you have the first bat gas bomb or whatever you want to call it um and of course gordon's just completely dumbfounded as the rest of them are and i love the shot of batman in front of the axis sign i just think it's just beautifully beautifully done it's a very quick thing but that's one that always sticks with me and here we have the complete rebirth of jack napier as joker and you can just see the skin has turned white and the fingernails are kind of greenish. So, and of course, the acid has eaten away at the glove and he's dropped the, the Joker card. And of course, the cards are probably discussed a little bit more in the novelization because you get the extra inner monologue. So after that, we're given a bit of a breather. We're back in the newspaper office and uh, we're given more of the duo's hunt for Batman's nocturnal patterns. And you can see where their stuff is developing. But, of course, no, Vicky's got to dash off. And Knox is completely like, oh, no, not that guy. Oh, man. Um, again, this is kind of played more for comedy. But in the original uh, Sam Hamm version, Knox kind of gets more and more, you know, kind of worked up. Because, you know, in the film, he alludes to, you know, uh, that he does have a thing for Vicky Vale. But uh, in the original Sam Hamm version, it's a lot more direct, and eventually, you know, he gets so flustered and fed up that he deduces that Bruce Wayne is Batman, tries to convince Vicky of this, and actually goes and confronts Bruce, you know, and it's like, hey, what are you doing, you know, um, you know, if, if you don't stop dating her, I'm going to expose you, um, so he had, a, he had a lot more to do, and it was a lot more, um, a lot more going on there, but, uh, you know, in, in the final version, he's kind of reduced to just being the audience surrogate the voice of the common man um you know some some light comedy bits but uh you know really after a certain point doesn't appear all that much 
Now, here we have the date with Bruce and Vicky. Originally, this was to have been a horseback riding sequence around the grounds of Wayne Manor, which, again, you know, is how Sean Young um, injured herself falling off a horse, practicing for it. Um, I do like the I do like this whole bit. It's it's a little little bit of comedy, a little bit of Bruce being a little more aloof. But here you can see for the first time he kind of lets that mask drop and just kind of acts more naturally which is the first time Vicky laughs, and then they get out of there and they go to the more intimate setting in the kitchen. I also think, again, it's a, it may be a Citizen Kane nod, but the long table alluding to the famous breakfast table scene, um, of course, that may or may not be, it may just be my own head. Um, here we have the great scene with Alfred talking about young Bruce and Michael Gow is just wonderful and everything, but he has such a warmth as Alfred, and that was, that was a total Tim Burton pick. Uh, because he grew up on classic horror of the 50s and 60s, particularly Hammer Horror, which Michael Cowell was in a number of, of the company's great horror masterpieces. Um, and, you know, could play both light and dark, but brings a brings such a warm parental quality to, to Alfred, sort of like the, the grand old grandfather in a lot of ways, which, you know, Vicky kind of talks about here, and then Alfred reminds her of you know, her, her grandparents and such. Um, but again, this, this whole more intimate, natural conversation is what really lays the foundation for their relationship in this film, which is again, a lot more believable. And, you know, you can see that, you know, Keaton is Bruce is actually, you know, listening to everything she says and is completely focused on her and not anything else. Um, and we have a slight, slight push in, you know, nothing, nothing obtrusive, but, this this scene feels like it's out of you know a standard movie. It's not out of a comic book movie, which is I think what this film really cemented in people's minds that you know a comic book movie didn't have to be you know something about funny pages and could be successful. Um, you know, of course, Superman the movie had already done that, but you know, after that, you know, accepting the um, Superman sequels, which you know really petered out um, because of the way they were made and things like that. Um, you know, there, that nobody else had tried. And, you know, like I've said many times, it took Mike Yuslin over 10 years to get this film made. So it's not like anybody was really re willing to go make a a budget grand picture about a comic book, you know, character, because, you know, those are from the funny pages for kids. Uh, here we have the wonderfully semi-grotesque scene of Jack going to the back alley surgeon. <laughs> Uh, sort of has echoes of, you know, stuff like, uh, you know, classic gangster films where they get a new face uh, or uh, the classic uh, Bogart Pakal picture, Dark Passage, where there there's the scene where Bogart's character, after breaking out of prison, has to go and get plastic surgery on the sly. And it's it's kind of leery, you know, because you don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh, also, you know, he's going to look at himself in the mirror. You can't see what's going on. You can only see the reaction of the freaked out surgeon. Um so it's kind of maybe has a little nod to the classic horror film, The Raven, as well. And I love this bit. He's like, and then look at the terrible things I have to work with. I have no equipment. <laughs> He's like trying to reason. <laughs> like, He's like, I'm so sorry. Like, I did the best I could. Can you give me my $100 now? <laughs> and Jack breaks the light. So again, it delays the reveal of the Joker. But now you hear the laugh, you know, coming out for the first time. The, the laugh has been unchained. Uh... Again, this film is very, very dark, and uh, a lot of the video releases, you, you don't quite get that. Um, so, you know, it, the, the, the Joker reveal is delayed, but you know stuff is happening, and we're getting this nice cross-cutting between uh, the birth of the Joker, uh, Jack's final descent into madness, and Bruce Wayne, actually in a very dangerous position himself, he's actually, you know, um, becoming acquainted and falling in love with someone, which is really not what Bruce Wayne needs to do. Uh, Sam Hamm kind of put it, his his concept of uh, of this was, you know, you hear you have an insane man who has to dress up like a bat and go out and fight crime, uh, but, you know, love is introduced in his life, and the love kind of, well, starts to make him become more sane. So you have an insane man becoming sane at the point of uh, someone going and becoming, you know, the most insane villain of all. And then he's got to cope with all this, um, which is, again, a really interesting arc, but something that, again, is very subtextual in the finished film. So here we have Joker going back to confront Grissom. And again, as you can see, he's in very dim lighting with the lighting from the elevator behind him uh, is the only thing that's framing him. 
Uh, again, a lot of video releases. This is you know kind of bright. You can kind of see the facial outlines, whereas originally it's it's a lot darker in the theatrical prints and the 4K, uh, where you can't really make out the the white face until he really steps into the light. Um, should mention here you have Jack Palance as Grissom, and you needed somebody with that level of gravitas to you know ostensibly be you know uh, the boss of Jack Nicholson. <laughs> uh, that's something Tim Burton talks about in the commentary and being terrified of directing Jack Palance. Um, and here you have the final throwing away of the Jack Napier, Napier character that he's fully transitioned over because he says you know I've already I've been dead already and you know Jack is dead my friend. Love that Grissom is still trying to weasel his way out. Either. Maybe we can make a deal. You can see the main outline of a smile forming. Uh, and he steps into the light here. And you see the purple mark on the side of his neck, which they talk about in the making up documentary and stuff. Uh, they did several takes of this and had to keep redoing the makeup. And it kept rubbing off on the coat collar. So they painted that purple. And eventually, in the take they used, um, some of that had unfortunately rubbed off on his neck. So that's one of those, just see it and go with it, and just kind of ignore it. But the performance was the best in that take, so that's the one that uh, Tim Burton and everybody went with. But uh, one, it's one of those, once you see it, you can unsee it things. And, of course, Joker doesn't just shoot Grissom. He shoots him multiple times and laughs and cavorts around. Now, this is a very small transitional scene that I really love. You have the light playing of the theme on piano. Bruce is looking super pensive. And here, you know, he can see that, you know, oh, crap, I've screwed up. What am I doing? <laughs> you know, but I love the look on his face. I love the way that this plays out. And it's all quiet. And he puts his arms around her and then looks off into the darkness. Now, this, this may take it a, a bit too far. Uh, you know, this is where Vicky wakes up, looks over, and Bruce is, you know, hanging upside down like a bat. Uh, you know, it's like, um, that's not giving the game away, is it? Um, but it does show that he's still distant. He's still cut off from the world. You know, he's got to get up and do something. Uh, most people miss that he's actually like doing something with his, with his arms. You know, he's, you know, he's actually got like some sort of weight or something, or he's doing exercises, but he's got to do something because his mind's always active. And here we come back to Joker looking over the city that he's going to pulverize and rule and the kingdom that will bring a smile to his face and the newspaper linking back to batman which further associates the rivalry that joker will find with the dark knight detective this film is so quotable <laughs> it's not just the famous lines because he does that but then here jack adds the little Ooh. <laughs> it's just it's the right level of malevolence and like goofiness that does feel very Joker. And here you see the the walls of Bruce Wayne's armor start to go back up because he's he's trying to push Vicky away, but trying to be nice about it and trying to give himself space and time to to figure it out. I think it's interesting. The billionaire decided to go sleep on the couch because. He's like, I've gone too far. I've gone too far. I'm gonna sleep on the couch. Um, and but again, this does feel you know more realistic. You know, they 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 had a had a one night affair, and then they're like, well, what do we do? This is kind of awkward. And you know, that's you can actually see Bruce rubbing his temples, like, oh God, what did I do? And then this is a great bit here that clues Vicky in because, you know, she's like, you know, have a good trip and everything. See you later. And Alfred's like, oh, we're going to we're going to be here for quite some time. What are you talking about? And she's like, oh, and this, of course, sets the wheels in motion that, you know, is she being blown off? What is Bruce Wayne up to? What are the closed doors of his personality? And also, you know, the fact that, you know, Bruce and Alfred aren't always 100 percent on the same page. <laughs> The reactions in this scene are perfectly done. Like the, the the fainting, the timing, and then I always love how Joker tries to drink out the champagne goblet and they actually hold it so you can see it lines it up and then just does it a little bit. This is a riff on, you know, the classic gangster film moment of the, you know, bosses getting to at the bar at the board table. Uh, you could link it to the Godfather as well with the meaning of the five families. And of course, 
He's killed Grissom, basically assumed control of Grissom's empire. You kind of wonder how he's done that just by shooting one guy. Um, but basically, you know, these are the other bosses he's got to knock off or bring under his wing uh, to take over control entirely and make it the Joker's criminal empire. You kind of wonder, this is the first time you see the flesh-colored makeup and he's talking normally and you're like, but when he sticks the hand out, you know, you know something's up. And this is actually, you know, quite gruesome for, you know, something that's still only PG-13. This is, again, has that horror vibe to it that, you know, when you're a little kid and you come to this, you kind of, there are moments that are kind of scary. I mean, this dude's head literally gets melted off and he's a skeleton. I love how Joker is singing through the smoke, just holding onto the hand still, and, of course, cackling madly. And then this is a, that's a beautiful, uh, you know, pull out on the zoom just to give you that sort of jerk back into reality and then all the Tommy guns rush in. <laughs> Hot under the collar. <laughs> and then here we have the first reveal of the white makeup under the flesh makeup, which is a brilliant conception. Like I, I, I don't, I don't even know how they came across doing this, but uh, you know, looking at the the making ofs and stuff, it's it was a really arduous task, and it adds a lot to this performance and the visuals alone. Now, of course, they lead everybody out, and you wonder, well, why don't they just go ahead and shoot them? Well, you know, that would just be too easy, but they'll get there. Now, I love this bit here because we have Joker talking to Bob, who still is number two man, and setting up, you know, the laundry list of items that Joker wants Bob to do, but it culminates in Jack doing a Grissom or technically a Jack Palance impression with right down to the... You are my number one, a guy. <laughs> and he's like squeezing his shoulders too. I just love that. And then you just get, yes, sir. And he just puts on the sunglasses. <laughs> so you have uh, just Jack doing Jack, which I always... And then the mouthing off and everything. Now, here we have one of the best Joker scenes in the film, which is Joker talking to the charred corpse and literally doing uh, like they're actually having a conversation and reacting. But it's really his own inner psychotic coming out. But he's giving it rationality. He's like, oh, oh, grease him now. Oh, okay, we'll go kill him all. <laughs> and I love his facial reactions. He's literally playing it out like it's two people talking. I'm glad you're dead. <laughs> and it's a very chilling moment, and you still have the smoke in the air and everything. Again, there is a darkness to this film. It's not Jack being Jack and doing the 66 show. Uh, I should mention, for Laserdisc fans, this is where you hit the first uh, side break which is very well placed. And I've seen the film on laser just so many times now that I can't watch this and not think, oh, that's the side break. And, and then I'll mention when we get to the uh, second side break for the disc change. Now we're back to uh, Vicky and Knox, and this is where Knox is expressing his misgivings about her relationship with Bruce Wayne and, and how she's gone away from him in the Batman case. And you can see, you know, his... His disdain that, you know, she's going away. And he's like, man, come back to this. Come back to Batman and, and the office and late coffee at night. Bruce in his super nondescript car, although the gates of Wayne Manor have very suspicious bat-like wings on it. Here we have Vicky Vale, girl detective. And <laughs> she's just going she's gonna to trail Bruce, who is apparently... Not very good at spotting uh, tails. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I just always thought that was funny. And now she's going to follow him down to, of course, what is Crime Alley. Um, none of this is explained. Uh, all of this, this is an example of doling out the Batman backstory. I had to point out that was the taxi cab with the Sanchez Mexican foods on it <laughs> that you saw in the opening. Um, you, if you pay close attention, you'll see a lot of little things pop up over and over again because... While the set was, you know, sprawling and massive, you know, it, it wasn't a whole city. So there are some points where you can see some of the same things. Um, just like a lot of the action of the film is all around the Monarch Theater. So you see the Monarch Theater practically everywhere. 
So we have the two roses uh, for Bruce's parents. This is, you know, supposedly taking place around the anniversary of their deaths, uh, which is the real reason why he said he had a, a, a business trip to go on, but it was really to have his annual, uh, for lack of a better term, his annual dead parents holiday. <laughs> so, and of course, you know, Vicky is saying this and has no freaking idea what's going on. And again, if you know nothing about Batman, the audience doesn't know. So again, the mystery of Bruce Wayne and Batman is still playing out. And he just walks away and you're just kind of left wondering, huh? And I do like that she walks over and 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 picks up the the roses in her hand and kind of has this this moment to, where you can see the wheels turning in her head. So there's a direct physical connection to that too. And this leads into the uh, murder of the other gang leaders on the city hall steps because of course the Joker would not do it without theatricality. This allows Knox, Vicky Vale, and Bruce Wayne to come back into the scene and all be here at the same time and all witness this. And, uh, you know, Vicky can try to confront Bruce and see that he's totally out of it. And he just kind of wanders into this whole thing and, again, is the outsider. He's the only one that stays standing. He almost gets shot in the arm, doesn't even react to it. And, of course, has the bullet hole in the sleeve. And this, of course, where Bob will get to take pictures of everybody, which will then introduce Vicky to uh, Vicky's image to the Joker, although she's standing right there. I guess he just didn't see her. Um, the mimes are the first instance that you know something's up. And now we have the Elfman music coming in with the Joker-like themes. So you know that something's something's cockeyed, you know? And then I love the second mime that comes up and just waves at Bruce. <laughs> you know, Bruce just stares and goes back, you know? Okay, something something's off, but, you know, maybe maybe they're just street mimes. Nobody likes, nobody likes mimes in Gotham City. <laughs> become an impromptu press conference about the passing over of Grissom's businesses. And it's sort of like the open secret because everybody knows about Grissom and the gangsters and the sort of gangster army that controls the city. I love Joker being in the fancy outfit here. And he has the sort of libretto to the voice and everything. And the theatricality. And of course, he kills Vinny with the... I guess, poison metal tipped <laughs> quill pen, which is just a, a bizarre thing. And they put the little arrow sound effect on it, which is a cute gag touch. Which of course gives you pen is mightier than the sword. But again, you can see Bruce's reactions are totally, he's totally distanced from reality here. And of course they could have just shot everybody, but you know, that then nobody would be alive to tell the tale. <laughs> And you can see Bruce moves forward almost like he's Batman, but he's not in costume. And you can see the open mouth expression on his face. Uh, this ties in later to, of course, him realizing that in this version, the Joker is the one who killed his parents. I love the reflection of Bruce there as Joker waves, and Bruce is just standing there, and his reflection is trapped over Joker's own visage, which is a cool thing. And then he turns to Vicky, turns away, turns back, and is totally out of it and just runs off. Um... But this is maybe the first moment you can see that the seed is planted in Bruce's mind that he knows that face from somewhere. He knows that voice, but he can't quite place it. So that's something that's going to, of course, culminate in his realization towards the end of the film. And here we have the first of the Punch-Out TVs, which will always make you jump if you've never seen the film before. And more of the iconic lines. Somebody tell me what kind of a world we live in. Where a man dressed up as a bat gets all of my press. And Bob just stares. Here we have Alfred being dutiful and the beautiful moment where he gets the coat, knows Bruce needs water, and finds the bullet hole and says, I'm relieved you're home at all. And you get the lovely discussion about Vicky being you know, an actual human being who should be called back, an intelligent person, and Bruce just turns and does the, you know, does the I got more important crap going on right now. Um, and of course, I got to mention the amazing Keaton eyebrows you see here, the way he just arches them up naturally, and they look like bat wings. They just do. I, I it's, it's so beautiful. And once again, once you notice them, you, you can't not notice them. And I know it's a minor thing, but just just the way his eyebrows arch up like that, it's it's like bat wings, and it's great. 
I do love how he drops everything here, leans forward, and just says, you know, that he knows that Napier is still alive. You can see Alfred's reaction. You know, Alfred is very much a team player in this, in, in Batman 89. He assists with everything that Alfred immediately is business-like. He knows why Bruce is serious here. And then they do have a moment where Bruce reflects on it for a second, turns around and says, of course, she is great, isn't she? And Alfred's just like, yes. So that's, again, that that flash of the the possible happy future that Bruce could see for himself. But he's like, no, i got to push that away. got to push that away. Again, going back to the idea of this is the insane man possibly becoming sane at the worst possible moment because he's finally Batman. And, you know, that's not in the plan. Um, that, of course, is explored a lot more fully in Mask of the Phantasm with the wonderful uh, romantic arc uh, for Bruce in that film. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, correlation you can make between the two. And here Vicky is studying the photos of, of Bruce and, you know, going like, what in the world is he doing in that alley? Now, this is an interesting point. You wonder what these faces are, what these photos are, what the CIA folder is. It's something that's kind of mentioned in the novelization, but basically uh, Joker raided the chemical fi uh, files uh, of the uh, factory, and I guess they collaborated with the CIA on a failed toxin that caused people to die with grins on their faces, and Napier being with the chemistry background reforms it into Smilex, uh, and that's that's how he comes up with it. You know, it's like if you ever wondered how did he just suddenly make Smilex and people died grinning, that's kind it again is very subliminal and i did not catch it for the longest time but that's why there's the cia files and the picture of the dude dead with a grin on his face and of course that's what leads him to tainting all the beauty chemicals and stuff because he could get chemicals from the chemical plant sold to all the companies and then it could get in all the products so he planned everything basically used this stuff and turned it into a super version called smilex um Again, this is this is kind of me with some supposition here, but that's what it seems to indicate. And again, a lot of that, there's a little mention of it in the novelization, which kind of makes it a few interesting points. And I still have no idea what Jack is saying there. The I am of a mind to make a Mookie or something. I love the fact that they've got a 50s style kitchen table there with the yellow padding and stuff, which again, seems like a Tim Burton touch. And then Joker just twirls away with the light, beautiful string music. Love how Axis Chemicals suddenly back open for business and nobody thought, hey, um, you know, this Joker guy's around. Um, if he's Jack Napier, couldn't he be at the chemical factory he supposedly died at? And he tainted a bunch of chemicals at the source? Wouldn't that be at the chemical factory? So... <laughs> But, you know, that's that's a classic superhero trope of, you know, people not figuring out the obvious villain hideout location. Now, here we have the news, news scene set up, which, again, it's set up like, you know, a modern or then at the time 80s newscast. But you have the sort of 30s looking logo. And I love the super cheesy intro music like any television news. Um, and this, of course, sets up the gags of, you know, Smilex coming around and that it killed two models. Originally, uh, Vicki Vale was at a photo shoot, and that's she literally saw them die of Smilex poisoning, um, which would have been a more grisly way to see it. Um, but I do that was in the earlier script drafts. I think it was in the Sam Ham version. Um, but uh, I love the reveal here, where you have the more serious news coming in, more deaths, and then of course the death of the poor <laughs> female newscaster, who starts laughing at the horrible news, and they use this to bring this news in, and of course we get the payoff later on when they're shown without makeup, which is something you don't necessarily notice as a kid, but it never fails to crack me up that they found a way to use uh, the TV news and then you know showing everybody with the horrible-looking faces and zits and stuff. Now here you have Joker interrupting the signal, which is you know something kind of classic or a classic trope of comics, but I love the fact it's set up like an old-fashioned, quirky commercial right down to the blind taste test and everything, and he's in front of an obvious supermarket backdrop. And of course, love that Joker. <laughs> it's just ridiculous enough. And I love the not an actor in Brand X. It's so perversely funny. And it's just... <laughs> it's, this is one of the things you can tell they had a ball shooting at. It's just so completely wacky 
so messed up. And here we have the reveal of Smilex in action. <laughs> Hair color, so natural. Only your undertaker knows for sure. And we cut to Bruce, completely dead-eyed. Again, every time he encounters Joker, he has that sort of dead-eyed look, which again goes to the idea that psychologically his head is already trying to piece this stuff together and also figure out what his goal is. And he kind of like shakes himself right here. Um, and that, that was a great transition from the TV station to actually getting back to looking more into Jack. And now we just turn it off. Now, if you look there very closely, very quickly on the left, you actually see the photo of young Jack, which is, again, something I didn't notice for the longest time. And it's like, if Bruce actually had looked at this 100%, maybe he would have realized Jack was his parents' killer much earlier. Um, but again, it's very subliminal. So again, going to this idea that he already knows that Jack Napier killed his parents, but he can't piece this together due to the childhood trauma or blocking stuff out or not remembering everything, again, due to trauma. But it's, it's a little tiny thing, it, and since it's there, I think it had to be put there purposely because, of course, they would have had to make up a, a photo because of all that. But it's an interesting little thing. Now, here we go back to the payoff of that joke because no one's got makeup on, and, of course, the newscaster has the giant zit on his nose and the big mole, and his eyes are all red and everything, <laughs> which just cracks me up. Um, yeah, it's really simple. You don't notice it as a kid, but it's, it's just, yeah, it's too funny. <laughs> Cause if you've ever been amused by the, the outright fakery of local TV news, it just, it, it gets to my funny bone every time. Now here we have again, the mayor being his ultimate useless self. And he has the line, you know, I don't care if I have to get out there with a shotgun myself. I'm going to get these people to this festival cause we're going to have a party, man. And just, you know, badgering off his responsibilities on other people. And here, of course, we have the setup for the Flugenheim Museum. Uh, and, of course, uh, the Joker decided to use uh, a false state with Bruce Wayne. I do love the fact that Bruce doesn't even realize that for a brief second there that he's not meeting her today, um, which again plays into the whole slightly aloof and disconnected uh, Bruce Wayne that we're getting in this. Now here we get to see the flesh makeup going on instead of coming off, which is a nice touch. And here we see what's happened to poor Alicia, or at least the the masked version. So this sort of creepy visage goes very oddly with the portrait behind her. And uh, also, you know, it's going to get revealed here in the Flugenheim. And of course, outside the Flugenheim, you saw there very quickly was the taxi with the Sanchez Mexican food line on it. So we either it, it's on a lot of taxis or they just kept using the same taxi over and over. Um, again, when you've seen this movie too many times, you start to notice stuff. Again, also, the older transfers being kind of brighter, it does reveal some stuff that you probably wouldn't have seen on a theatrical release print. Um, that is, again, something that was really good about the new 4K transfer is that they did bring back a lot of the uh, darkness. There was a little bit brought back on the, the Blu-ray, but that was really just more like a HD upgrade of the 2005 DVD. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's how the film kind of looked on video from VHS and Laserdisc to DVD to uh, Blu-ray. So, But that is something most people are not super aware of. And the photography of this film is really, really intricate. Um, you know, of course, all done in the pre-digital realm on these massive sets, which were not easy to light with all the shadow and fog. And um, it's an interesting design for this museum. Again, Anton first must be commended uh, in every way. Here we have the strange package and the urgent written in crayon, which apparently was Tim Burton's handwriting. He admits in the commentary he wrote these little cards, and his handwriting is terrible. But I do love the fact that Joker has sent this, and his handwriting has like devolved to be like super childish in a weird way. It just adds to the sort of madcapness of his character. This is one of probably the few nods to the 66 series, the clouds of colored purple smoke knocking everybody out. It seems like every villain in almost every episode of the 66 series knocked people out with colored smoke, whether it be purple or green. And there we have the heads going into the um, to the food, which is a, a humorous touch. And you got to wonder, are all these people dead or are they just passed out? But 
I think the novelization says they're they're dead of Smilex, but you just don't know. I do love the fact this is held in silence. This sets up the Prince Party Man destruction of the museum. Of course, Prince wrote music for the film, basically turned into an entire conceptual album, and then Tim Burton and everybody was left with the task of, well, where do we put these in? Um, this is probably the one that sticks out the most because it you know, basically just takes over the soundtrack. But, I mean, it, it kind of works. Now, I'll, I'll just I'll re- rephrase that. It does work. Um, but it is, you know, it is maybe a little bit jarring for audiences today. Um, if you've been in this whole film and then you literally, a uh, Prince song takes over. But it has a sort of whimsy to it. So it goes with the complete desecration of famous works of art, which if that is right in there with the film Joker's idea of being a great homicidal artist and his whole thing about art is a part of Jack Napier, Jack Napier, Wow, Jack Napier's character that was always there, but is really only spelled out in the novelization. You don't get a whole lot of that pre-Joker, but it is in the um, in the novelization. I do love the fact that uh, you know he points out the picture of Washington, talks about the one dollar bill, and then the only painting that has you know elements of horror, expressionism, destruction, and everything he prevents from being destroyed. I kind of like that one, Bob. And then they get out of the uh, Prince song pretty quick. And, of course, that's explained by carrying around a boom box, so it makes sense. They made it work, you know. Um, I do love the sonic transition here. This is basically, you know, an impromptu date. And here we have Joker press the button and then immediately switch over to the classical, stereotypical date music and then lights the candles with the flamethrower lighter. And then you have that light, soft music in the background. <laughs> So he's here to look at her work. This, again, is about Joker's art fetish, for lack of a better term. And I love how he's like, crap, 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 until he gets to the Corto Maltese photos. Now this is good work. The skulls. The bodies. You give it all such a glow. I don't know if it's art, but I like it. And this is what gives him the impetus for her being the chronicler of his work. And unfortunately, outside of this scene, that's an idea that kind of goes away. But the idea is that, you know, he's going to capture her and she's going to be his artistic companion and his chronicler of all his great deeds and things like that. That was spelled out a little bit more in, in in the script drafts and stuff and... Also a little bit in the major scene that was taken out uh, when uh, after he confronts her in the apartment and takes Bruce out of the equation, or so he thinks, uh, you know, the scene where they uh, Bruce chases them down the street and then, you know, he Joker winds up holding the mayor hostage. You know, he's got Vicky there to take pictures. And um, <laughs> I love the way that's played. The... the do I look like I'm joking? Just like, well, again, it does add some sort of realistic credibility to it. She's trying to figure out what the hell this crazy thing in front of her is after. And here we have the reveal of Joker's avant-garde and what he's done in disfiguring Alicia. So here we have the mask come off, and she's speaking in a sort of slurred voice where she's obviously kind of been, uh, you know, obviously drugged. Again, which is something that is spelled out in the novelization and uh, I think some of the script drafts. But, uh, of course, you know, eventually it's going to be alluded to that, uh, you know, well, she said expressly that she killed herself. But this is another moment that will freak little kids out. It's it's not, not major, but it's just a, like, it's the un, uncertain aspect of it. And, of course, has freaked Vicky out, who is literally at, at, at the point of, oh, oh my God, I got to get out of here. Batman's head on a lance. And now we build until the classic moment where Batman breaks through the skylight, which, of course, was then, you know, redone and reused in several of the sequels and is, you know, a a classic dramatic moment for (laughs) entering, entering a scene with a 
great, great excitement. And then here we have uh, Joker's referencing of the Wizard of Oz, which is kind of weird at first, but it's it's just kind of goofy enough. And again, building up the music cue, building up the suspense for the point where he turns around and you get this awesome shot of the makeup. And now the crash of the ceiling, brilliantly timed. And now we have the Batman theme coming in. The strange gadget, which of course is the line launcher. And of course, again, Batman himself is an enigma and a mystery. So every time he appears, there is that element of darkness and he doesn't say very much and it changes the context of the scene. I love Joker's line there, but I do hate the fact that it always seems like it's cut off in the beginning a little bit. You don't hear the where does he get part. And the first appearance of the 89 Batmobile, often called the Keaton Mobile. Um, still one of the most iconic of all Batmobiles. And here we have the first major shot of the afterburner and the chase through the streets of Gotham. And again, this is one of the scenes where it really pays off for actually building a, a, a large set because then you can actually have cars go through and move and have a sense of scope and scale and stuff. Um, whereas in, in Batman Returns, they didn't have nearly as much roadway, so they had to do a lot more cheating of you know reusing some of the same streets and stuff. And the chase itself was a lot smaller. Now here is the Bat Grapple, which some people say is too close to the 66 series, and why does he have to do that? But it's because he's making a sharp, you know, 90 degree turn at like 100 miles an hour. Or so you know, that's the idea. There's the Monarch Theater, of course, uh, popping up again. I don't know why it had to be a truck full of lettuce that they hit, but it, it's a truck full of lettuce. Uh, here we have the construction truck, which is why they have to get out and leave the Batmobile uh, because it's a construction site. It's a dead end. So if people ever wondered why they get out and just leave, it's because there's nowhere to go and the cops are coming after them and stuff. The novelization does spell that out a little bit more. There's an extra sentence or two, you know, like Batman had nowhere to go. I mean, it was better written than that, but that's why they get out and just run away. And here we have the... Beautiful animated effect of the shields, which, again, looks really striking still. And they've uh, the Joker cars have escaped from the onslaught of lettuce. And here we have one of my favorite bits. How much do you weigh? Uh, 108. And it's like, the Dark Knight detective should know she's lying about her weight. And she should have realized uh, he's asking that for an important reason. Um, but this, this is what sets up uh, when she grabs the grapple line from his belt. He's you know calculated for a certain weight, but because she lied, he goes flying off, hits the ground. That's what knocks him out uh, or well, stuns him and then allows him to be hit. So you see he's falling uncontrollably here and she goes up too fast. So... Kids, that's why don't lie about your weight when Batman asks you. He's asking for a reason. You can see they hit him there, and it's like a it's a weaker spot in the armor they managed to find by accident. This is the first time you see the bat suit in close up and <laughs> the light check his wallet. I love that he touches it with the gun barrel, but this is of course where they realize he's human after all. And it's really dramatic that they do go to take off the mask. And in the original uh, drafts they do and it's very dark out but bruce manages to fight all of them off with the mask off and just you know nobody nobody sees it um and vicky's up there taking pictures which is why it's so important for batman to get the pictures back because you know with the flash she ostensibly got him in costume without the cowl on um now this is an added bit and is you know straight out of it's pretty much the cairo swordsman from raiders of the lost ark and this would get repeated at the end of the film and in Batman Forever a couple times. Um, but I do like that, you know, they they have him pensive and waiting and they have him do the stuff with the gauntlets and actually fight him instead of just doing the one punch. It actually shows, you know, Batman has some fighting skills, which is very difficult to do in the original rubber bat suit because, you know, 
it's impossible to move. And here we have Bob realizing he has uh, better options elsewhere. <laughs> Vicky hides the film where she thinks Batman won't find it. She is wrong. Um, and I love in the novelization at this point, Vicky tries to just get away and Batman startles her because he knows where she's going to come down. Uh, here in the film, he just act- startles her. But I love the fact that he retorts about her lying about her weight because that just, you know, almost got him killed. <laughs> I love I love this. You weigh a lot more than you weigh a little more than 108. Oh, really? And here, of course, is the classic gag of stopping the car by remote. Now, this has definitely got to be probably the most Tim burton e or Tim Burton-ish moment of the whole film. You have the stylized forest, the red leaves. the It's just the Batmobile driving back to the Batcave, but it's so ridiculously dramatic. The Elfman score starts to build and swell. And honestly, the more I see this film, the more I think about it, the look on Batman's face, it's probably the most iconic moment of the film for me. And again, she asks, where are we going? Batman says nothing, has this complete cold look in his face, and he sees her already looking at him, so he presses down on the gas. The Batmobile flies towards camera. And seeing this theatrically in 89, you know, it's one of the moments that probably had to get all Batman fans, just like get the, the hairs standing up on the back of their neck. Um, and the Elfman score starts to swell further and starts to crescendo, um, culminating when they go through the cave entrance. Now, Vicky's starting to, you know, question, okay, what is this? She starts to look closer, and I love the bit that Batman has the light to turn on in her eyes, which then she looks away and then looks right at the cave wall. And now this is the moment. This is my favorite part of Elfman's score. It just goes for pure gusto here, and it's it's a climax in and of itself. And this is the first major reveal of the Batcave, and Vicky is just overwhelmed. She puts her face in her hand. And then it's over. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's that. That is my favorite moment of the film, really, and for for a lot of different reasons. And one of one of the reasons why this film should be watched in a in a home theater environment. And of course, turning on the lights reveals the design of the Batcave. A very you know very realistic, very workmanlike. Batcave is very believable that, you know, Bruce and Alfred could have designed most of this. I love the fact that he says bats are great survivors and he's literally nursing a bat back to health there in a bird cage. Um, I think in some of the scripts and in the novelization, it's described as having a, a, like a splint on its wing, which I don't think you can really see that, but the, it's alluding to, you know, there's, he's taking care of a bat, which is just something I thought was a, a really cute idea. Now we're going to have the, uh, to discussion of the Smilex problem and Batman piecing it together. The lighting here is very intricate. Uh, Batman's eyes are in and out of shadow. I love how Vicky's like trying to like peek around there. <laughs> and Batman like kind of does the does the turn. Of course, I was going to mention earlier the bat turn, as a lot of people like to call it, where uh, Keaton and the actors who followed him had to perfect the turning the whole upper body because there's not a lot of movement in the uh, in the bat suit itself. But, and of course she goes around to the other side and then he gets up and he kind of walks over. And when you really look at the movement, it's kind of funny. Now he's entirely in shadow, but his eyes are like gleaming in the light. So again, it's just really beautifully lit. Now he's going to turn around here and you're going to get it in, in close up with him in the foreground. And it's really beautifully done. And she says, some people say the same thing about you. And you can see his eye there. and He does look psychotic. <laughs> and he's like, what people... You're not exactly normal. And then he just starts to confront her. And he's in and out of shadow there with a darker edge. And then she's like, what do you really want from me? And that, of course, leads to, there is something you have that I want. And the way this is staged here, you know, it's he obviously hit her with knockout gas. But, you know, you're kind of left wondering, what exactly did he do? Um, again, spelled out more in the script drafts and the novelization, but, um, you know, he obviously had to find the film, so he must have found it in her shirt, so (laughs) go figure. Um, 
Oh, he took the film. It's convenient she woke up right when you know, Allie called and the late edition wasn't out yet. I love that even in this list, and you can tell he's genuinely always worried about her. You know, he, he, Knox is a decent guy, but I think he kind of gets a, a, a lot of flack because in the finished product, you know, he is a bit of an expository character, and he is a bit of a, he is a throwback character. But, you know, if you know a lot of 30s and 40s stories, particularly about, you know, newspaper men and women, you know, it makes total sense what they were going for. I thought the newspaper headline is so blatant. Batman cracks Joker's poison code. It's like, okay, I guess they're official now. And now we have more of Mr. Sid face. <laughs> uh, I don't know why that cracks me up so much, but it does. I've given a name to my pain, and it is Batman. And now we're going to shoot with a sawed-off shotgun. Joker doesn't really like television. put so much gravitas in every line it, it, you cannot say that jack nicholson just phoned it in i think that that is a great disservice um to the performance and to the film um i do like this establishing shot here and that they hold it for a minute and we have bruce down here in the back cave and he's not in costume or anything he's just literally he works non-stops his brain is always going um like you have a microscope here and you know he's just Oh yeah, I, I am also a normal person. Oh yeah, let me let me maybe go and see if I can smooth things over. Um, I was just thinking about you know this Batman stuff. She has like rose, like two little flowers. It's like hi. It's like yeah, I'm super pathetic. <laughs> this is one of the you know great little dialogue scenes that you know is pretty much out of another movie. Um, this is the scene that originally set up, you know, Joker comes in and everything, but, uh, originally the package comes first and, you know, Bruce is thinking about telling her his true identity, but he's actually got the utility belt with him and he kind of sneaks around the package that Joker sends to Vicky and uses the utility belt to check it. And then eventually when Joker shoots him, it hits the part, the scanner and the utility belt and uh, Joker takes Vicky, and Bruce has to give chase without the bat suit, and that's where he commandeers a police horse and all that stuff, and then Alfred gets him a costume, and then they wind up on the city hall steps where they're going to unveil a statue, and it's been disfigured as the Joker, and then Batman shows up, foils the Joker's plans, Vicky's there to take photos and uh, document the Joker's art. And, of course, you know, Batman foils all of it. Joker tries to hold the mayor hostage and manages to escape. So it was a whole, you know, action sequence that got dropped, probably for time and money and everything. And also probably because the bat suit would look very weird in broad daylight. <laughs> that is a funny line, but this is, it's sort of a, sort of a weird thing to have for a Batman film. And you know, I, I like the way this is played, but again, it feels kind of out of another movie. You know, it's like a guy comes down and kisses somebody on the forehead and says bye and goes to a job and, and no, no. But, you know, it's it's believable enough that, you know, this version of Bruce is trying to figure out a way to build up to the confession but put it into terms that you know everybody's going to understand because again it's like he's always an outsider he's always trying to find ways to interact because of all his trauma and all of his preparation and then being batman he is forever separated um from everybody else which is why relationships are so complicated it's not just because he's batman it's because he's also really freaking messed up um and that's that's what Keaton brings so wonderfully here, and also in returns as well, and which is why I think you know Tim Burton was on the nose in saying, "Hey, I think I think Michael can really do this." Um, and this is a cute moment here where he just mouths it, but he mouths it like like he's actually hearing a reaction. And of course, Joker's breaking in, and here again you have the sort of wide-eyed movement where Bruce is like shocked, literally. But he manages to shake it off, 
And in a beautiful moment of showing that, you know, he actually does have a brain. He is the Dark Knight detective. Uh, he grabs the silver tray and shoves it under his shirt because, you know, he knows this guy is a psycho. And he's got to somehow deflect his attraction to Vicky. He's got to find a way out of there. He's got to also play hacked. So there's a couple levels going on here. You have Joker, like the jilted lover. You have Bruce, like the, again, the the rooster in the hen house. You have uh, him, Joker, revealing that Alicia has died. And you have Bruce trying to, like, play all sides, like, where he's still trying to pretend like he's the rich playboy and not Batman and find a way out where Joker won't literally just kill him because chances are Joker would just kill him for being there. And it's also, it shows him as being a lot more intelligent than just, you know, the magic bullet getting deflected by the detector from the belt, uh, which is, you know, a lot more of a, you know, old school adventure storytelling trope. This gives him some intelligence. I love how he re Joker reaches off and switches off the music because he just carries around the romance tape with him. And Joker immediately knows who it is because Joker's not a dummy. And and the way this is played here, Bruce is... Keaton is playing Bruce as playing a false version of Bruce. He's got this sort of tough front. And he starts talking about this, you know, character, but he's actually talking about Jack Napier's background. Of course, it'd be weird, you know, if Joker thought, why is he talking about my old life? How does he know about me? Why is he reading police records? Oh, wait, he's probably Batman, you know? <laughs> But I love the way this scene is played. I love the way Joker is like kind of like, ah, oh, that's a good story. Yeah, and he kind of follows him over. And Bruce is, you know, like picking up stuff and he's looking at the mask here. And of course, that's covered to pick up the fireplace poker to then get to the you want to get nuts bit, which I love a lot of people joke about. But You can, you can start to see the crazy coming through <laughs> right there. And then, come on, let's get nuts. And here we have Dance with the Devil in the Pale Moonlight, which is the ultimate what? That's the payoff for all the times where Bruce has been freaked out and his brain is telling him something. And that's Bruce getting shot. So that is... <laughs> That is exactly why he did what he did, and he's playing it to the hilt here. I mean, I'm sure that kind of, you know, knocked him for a loop, and the novelization, you know, kind of says that as well, but, uh, you know, that allows him to do the Batman ninja move when Vicky comes back. It's kind of weird, though, if Joker goes to all this trouble, and then why does he just leave Vicky there? Um, you have the box that came first originally that Bruce used the utility belt to check, but... Yeah, I mean, it's kind of weird. Why does he just leave Vicky? <laughs> I love the fact that Joker's like, I'm so sympathetic, and then just immediately 180 degrees, and then goes even further into weird comedy with this little farting noise effect. <laughs> Bruce Wayne's a ninja like Batman. Whoa, that's weird. And then is capped off by this gag with the dead flowers, which does seem like a Tim Burton style gag. That's the thing. You can you can see flourishes that do feel very Tim Burton y, which at the time we wouldn't really have, you know, gotten, you know, you know, you had Pee Wee and you had Beetlejuice, so you would have gotten the idea, but you know, seeing his whole body of work that's come since, you know, you could see the Tim Burton flourishes that really help give a certain peculiar identity to the movie that that also you know keeps you in, interested and invested um and here we have the first instance of the backstory and the whole notion about bruce being a reclusive and an outsider what's not spelled out in the movie it's in the novelization it's in a number of the script drafts but he has actively you know tried to erase his presence there are no photos of him you see knox had to dig this up in the archives because uh, everything else was gone 
And then all station, like I think Vicky or Knox tries to get something from the, uh, you know, TV station and they have nothing on file. It's all been, you know, destroyed or removed or, you know, mysteriously lost. So that alludes to Bruce actually going around and buying up stuff so people don't know. Which is, again, something that is not really in the film, but you could kind of get that sense if you had seen it enough times like I have. <laughs> it's also kind of funny. It's like Alfred is the uh, the Batman secretary as well as Butler. <laughs> It's like they have a filing system and I, I guess Bruce asks Alfred to get the file on his parents all the time. And here we have Alfred as Bruce's conscience as as he frequently espouses and, and really, you know, should be because he is the conscience of Bruce <laughs> and is more realistic, you know, the angel on his shoulder. Again, that that glance, all of all of Keaton in this movie is as as Bruce is very, very subliminal. He he cut out a lot of his own dialogue as he did in Returns, and it's it's very again plays to the notion of the whole film is very subtextual, which is why it rewards repeated viewings. I love this sort of duel between the two. <laughs> we are not prepared to discuss any deals, and he finally shuts them out entirely. Um, I love that he's appearing in the, the flesh colored makeup and he talks about Grissom, but I'm actually okay. He also had a tremendous singing voice. And this is where he announces that the festival will still go on and he's going to do it himself and drop the 20 million on the crowd to get all the people there and then duke it out with Batman himself and literally attract him there. Like he's waving the flag. This is, this is the gauntlet being thrown. Of course, get some viewpoints of other members of Gotham society, which couldn't give a crap until 20 million, folks. Something I should mention about the money that is unfortunately not present in the film. Um, I believe they did shoot it. It's in the script drafts and the novelization as well, but he doesn't really drop real money. It's fake money. And people only start realizing that towards the end, once the Smilex is about to start being uh, pumped out uh, and like some start to assault the floats and they have to be pushed off and they start throwing things at Joker because they look at the money and like the ink comes off on their hands. And like instead of George Washington, it's it's a Joker picture, hence my face on the one dollar bill. I wish that was still in there because I just thought that was a great touch. But again, I think they shot it. I think it just got dropped. Uh, which is unfortunate because I thought it was a very jokery thing to do. So he gets them all c to come out and then just kills them anyway, and they didn't get anything. And this is where you know it's game on. That that look, the music cue, right there at that moment, although it's a little strange. It's like Bruce Wayne sits around in blue jeans in the Batcave. That just seems a little weird. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I love the, the black turtleneck and, and, and glasses, but it just always seemed kind of like, I guess this was casual Friday maybe. <laughs> so this is where we get the flashback. And again, we've seen Bruce stare at Joker's face again, and he's able to freeze frame it there as he has, you know, advanced video capabilities that mere consumers did not have in 1989. Although you could do that with uh, advanced laser displayers. Um, so here we get the first major live-action flashback of the Death of the Waynes coming out of the Monarch Theater. Um, it would have been cool if they were coming out of Mark of Zorro, which, of course, has been you know established as, as the film they had seen. Uh, depending on the age, it's the Fairbanks version or the 1940 Tyrone Power Fox remake. Um, but uh, it's, it's not. But at least they're coming out of a movie and not, you know, something else. What I do like about this is... All of the sound effects are heightened. It's a very sensory uh, flashback. So it's like this is all playing out in Bruce's mind, and his child mind remembers specific bits of detail. The Their footsteps, his father's going to reach over and get the popcorn and the noise of him reaching in the bag and crunching on it. Later on when the, the pearl necklace is broken, and of course the screams and the gunshots, um, so, you know, it, it's alluding to the fact that as a kid, he couldn't remember 100% of things, but the things that burned itself into his memory are these static images and these particular sounds. 
And I love how they just drop everything in, in terms of there's no dialogue, there's no anything, and then the gunshots are sudden. And Martha Wayne's scream kind of just reverberates. And the accomplice here looks kind of shocked and is kind of alluding to the fact that that's Joe Chill, who was the original killer of the Waynes. And here we have Dance with the Devil in the Pale Moonlight, which is the key phrase that unlocked all this in Bruce's, Bruce's mind. Now, the actor here they got to play Young Jack is phenomenal, and you have to wonder what it would have been like had he actually played Joker, because he's got a phenomenal face. And you can just imagine with the white paint and the green hair, you know? Um, and again, you see his photo in the Jack Napier dossier very early, on, you know, earlier in the film, but it's underneath other stuff. It's still there, so that's a nice touch. The idea of Joker being the killer of the Waynes, it's not something I like, but it works in the film with, with what they're going for. Sam Hamm didn't put it there, but it was something Tim Burton wanted in there, and it got put in when Warren Skarin was doing the rewrites. Here's probably the thing most fans would react to, Alfred just letting Vicki Vale into the Batcave, which is just like, seriously? But in this film, they've they've developed this this relationship between these two, and Vicky's already kind of figured everything out. I think there's a little extra in the novelization where she kind of goes and she's like, "Um, I'm gonna go to Wayne Manor," and I'm sure she talked to Alfred, and she's like, "Yeah, I know he's probably Batman. I gotta talk to him." You know, this is really the one scene where they actually talk about their feelings for another, and she's talking about why won't you let me in and things like that, and then he's like, "You got in." But he's he's very he's still reserved, and that shows he's got all these walls and layers that you know even with this relationship and this person that he obviously cares about, you know that it still you can tell this relationship is probably not going to work. You know, and of course she's gone in the second movie, but um, I, I like this scene. I like what it's trying to do. I just think that some of uh, Vicky's dialogue is is a little too on the nose, particularly the line "I gotta know if we're gonna try to love each other." Um, it's, it's like, but it, it's okay. It serves its purpose. I just wish it was a little, a little more fleshed out. Um, there is a, a, a stronger, Vicky is a stronger character anyway in the Sam Hamm original script. Um, but what remains is still good. And I, and of course you have, he's out there right now and I've got to go to work. And you have Princess Scandalous being used as the love theme by Elfman, which is a nice touch. Here we have the suiting up scene, which is probably still the best suiting up scene because it's simple, it's very bold, it's these wonderful static images, and then he looks up into the light, and he has a purpose, and his purpose is to stop the Joker, and any means necessary. So here we have the assault on Axis Chemical, the Batmobile in its most badass moment in the film, with the... Twin machine guns just breaking in and laying waste to the Joker's stronghold. Elfman's Q getting really, really amazingly heroic here. Now we have the shields, and I love that everybody comes in and then everything drops off when the bombs come out, and you get this brief little moment where everybody looks down confused. It's this wonderful little bit of humor. The music goes, everything goes out. And then we have a beautiful model explosion, courtesy of Derek Mettings, the great miniature artist, probably the greatest um, probably the greatest of all time, really. And Elfman comes back with this beautifully heroic theme as the, as the Batmobile charges through the flames. Again, this is the type of stuff you just don't get anymore. You, you cannot get this in a CGI landscape. Um, I love that pullback shot, and you can hear the tires of the Batmobile kind of going clickety clack over the <laughs> over the uneven pavement. And then the payoff is, of course, that Batman is all done it by remote control. I think that stems all the way back to the Sam Ham drafts. There are moments where they do that, and there's the infamous Bat Belt drop where Keaton turns around and the belt drops down <laughs> slightly. This is the point where the uh, laser disc version has the disc swap. And uh, this is where side three picks up if you're uh, watching this on LD. Here we have uh, Prince's Trust being used for the Joker's Parade. This is probably the best usage of any of the Prince music in the film uh, outside of Scandalous, um, which is in the end credits and is used someone as the love theme. This goes with the sequence, I think, a lot more than Party Man. 
and the uh, Flugenheim scene, but it, it, that that still works. But this one is actually timed to a lot of the movement, particularly Joker's arms going in and out. And you can see his glee, and everybody's going along with it because they're just going to get rich off the $20 million. Um, again, I wish the whole notion of the funny money had stayed, but uh, I've always looked to see. There's no deleted scenes that I've seen. Uh, they did release a little bit of the uh, DVD and uh, it's stuff like the uh, the little girl asking if it's Halloween when Batman is running away from the uh, Joker goons in the alleyway. A few little things like that. But uh, yeah, originally all this money was supposed to be, you know, Joker money and completely worthless. And so the greed of Gotham just leads to everybody being murdered. If you look at everybody's breath, you can see the cold fog because it was freezing shooting all this at Pinewood at night. Um, so a lot of times they were all freezing cold. So it's really amazing to see Jack so into this and all the makeup when they're all freezing their asses off. <laughs> I like the wider crowd shots in this, but unfortunately I think that, um, again, some of this may be because the a lot of the video releases are kind of brightened up, but some of the crowd shots do look like there's not a whole lot of people around. Like you can see here, there's just like, you know, 20, 30, 40 people there. This is the biggest crowd scene in the film. Um, again, when it's timed darker, it's, you know, a lot harder to notice, but you know, it, it wasn't possible for them back in the day to have, you know, like 3000 people around. This is an optical shot because you've got the extra balloons coming in, which is why of course it's gone a bit soft now we have Vicky and Knox on the on the uh, on the scene. Gotham's greed. Now originally they had more to do here, and they figured out that you know they figure out obviously that the balloons are full of Smilex, and eventually Knox himself will try and stop one of the balloons, and he manages to call Batman's attention to the balloons by making an impromptu bat signal, uh, by doing his coat over one of the street lights, and then the process winds up getting shot. Uh, which is why later on, you know, he's crumpled up in an alleyway. In the original drafts, he dies, uh, but that was, you know, of course, revised to what we get in the film. But he had more heroic stuff to do, which gave him a character arc of, you know, sort of being villainous in the middle of the film where he confronts Bruce and tries to blackmail him for staying away from Vicki Vale. And then eventually by the end, he gives his life to stop the Joker and realizes that Batman's crusade is worthwhile. Um, but of course, they've changed all that here. <laughs> They're at the entrance of the Batwing into the final denouement. I love how Joker has his side conversations with everybody off mic, which is <laughs> kind of funny. Nobody notices that they just put masks on. The little people, burden of your use, failed in useless lives. I love that he says this, and everybody is just like, they're still kind of dancing around. They're like, huh, what? What does that mean? And if you wonder where Joker got all this stuff, uh, in the novelization it alludes to, you know, he just went and raided the floats and balloons that were going to be used for the celebration and then just filled the balloons with Smilex himself. So it's not like he just had all this stuff waiting and ready, you know? Here they have Vicky discover the Smilex through her telephoto lens, and she puts two and two together. We have Knox go to the trunk, and then I love the karate chop to open the <laughs> broken lock. And with his mask, it's... Smilex pre-coronavirus. <laughs> Here we have Knox going for his heroic vibe. Like I mentioned before, this was part of the original drafts. And uh, here is where Knox would have gotten shot or injured and, you know, tried to make the bat signal. He originally did get more injured. And uh, when Batman escapes after the finale, he drapes his cape over the wounded Knox left in the alley and so everybody gathers around thinking it's Batman and then take the cape off and they go, Alex Knox? Alexander Knox is Batman? Um, so, yeah, that, that, was, that was something that got cut out but was apparently shot. Um, so if you ever wonder how Batman got out of there, um, that's why. You have to wonder why the Joker's goons were hanging on the mooring ropes because they were just going to 
fall off. I don't know why they were hanging on them. Can some really beautiful uh, miniature work there of the bat wing. Oh, Vicky just tries to drive off and manages to run into Knox. And then uh, he just gets thrown off the car, which practically like knocks him out. And he just passes out and gets super injured because he fell into some trash, which is kind of kind of a strange thing, I guess, because he got conked on the head there. But it, it seems like it didn't, didn't do very much. Um, that shot of the uh, Batwing, if you look really closely, you can see some bleed through of the background, which, of course, is just, you know, commonly going to happen with with opticals um but here we have the capture of the balloons and i love how batman does this and then barely makes it this is made more explicit in the script and the novelization but he really has to struggle here if you notice uh to not smash to the cathedral because he has to come in at such a steep angle and come in really fast and he barely makes it the joker is completely incredulous at this the the shot of the balloons going up is such a weird, bizarre thing. You're tempted to say, oh, that's a Tim Burton-y moment. But, you know, I mean, that was kind of already there in the script. Tim Burton just found a way to fulfill that. And then that over the matte painting and miniature of the city is just, just a beautiful, sublime, but slightly kooky effect. I love how Joker just walks on his goons. <laughs> Took me forever to notice that. The guy's just like bent over and he uses him as a stare. And this is Joker's complete miniature meltdown where he very stupidly but humorously kills Bob <laughs> with the gun Bob provides. <laughs> Gonna need a minute or two alone, boys. And then they just start shooting up the square to get everybody to run out. Ah, we don't need you anymore, people. Get out of here. There's, of course, the Monarch Theater yet again. And here we have the completely inspired... Totally unrealistic bit of the bat wing making the bat signal. But it does make sense because he has to build up momentum for the dive. Uh, again, this is something that's not super explicit, but Batman makes passes on the on the street. And when he goes down and everybody's like, oh, why doesn't he just shoot Joker? Well, in the novelization, it makes it clear that you know he's making multiple passes and he's getting rid of all the goons and the gun emplacements and stuff, which is why he blows up everything around Joker first. Um, so I think that's what he's doing here. It's not the, oh, I, I, I'm suddenly the no-kill Batman. I love the sound effect and Joker just hears him coming down. Come on, you gruesome son of a bitch. And you just hear the, the sound of the engine coming down as he's building up speed. I love the slow, methodical quality to it. He brings up the targeters. It's like, oh, yeah, he, he, he means business here. Um, this dude's going to murder everybody. <laughs> As you see, he's targeting the Joker's goons first and taking them all out. That's what the missiles and everything are for. And we have the target on the Joker, but he's you know shooting everything else. And I also think it's probably because the Batwing was not designed to just you know take out one dude in the middle of the street. You know, It's meant for taking out more large-scale topics. I mean, items. Now, the Joker's gun uh, taking on the Batwing, I mean, it works. It's it's comical that Joker's gun would do that, but it seems a little silly that it's just a regular gun. I love the reactions of everyone following over the Batwing and the chimes of the Elfman score here going a bit uh, dramatic. I love the smoke and the way it comes down in the miniature. The explosion and everything, it's, it's really well done. The only thing is this last shot here... That one, and this one especially, it kind of gives it away a little bit with the cars and stuff. It kind of does look a little miniature-y. But again, um, you know, probably pressed a bit for time. And again, the prints were originally a lot darker. And I've seen this movie way too many times. Um, originally, this was going to have been a major sequence in the earlier drafts with Robin involved because Robin was in a lot of the earlier drafts of the film, but they eventually just removed him as they also did from Returns. Of course, in the crash, Batman gets really injured, which is why he's all bloody and beaten up and moving around unsteadily for the rest of the climax. I've got to get you to the church on time. And if you ever wondered why Joker suddenly goes to the cathedral, well, it's kind of because they decided on the spot to make a new climax. This was partially because John Peters and Jack Nicholson had gone to a showing of the Phantom of the Opera, the uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, 
and like the you know grandiose end so they were like ah oh, we'll have them climb to the top and do this thing because i don't know when they were shooting this you know jack turned to tim burton and say why am i climbing up here and burton's like uh i'll tell you about it later here we have batman rising from the flames very phoenix like a bit bloodied bit unsteady on his feet the novelization goes so far as to say that he cracked a few ribs so he's like really beaten up and this is where we go right back into horror and expressionism the the monster of the night crashing through the sanctuary doors the staircase is right out of vertigo i've always felt that way um it may have not been intended but it had to have been it feels very vertigo like and of course elfman's score in this and returns has a lot of flourishes that feel very much inspired and right out of bernard herman's work so that this has always had that hitchcockian particularly vertigo element and i love this moment here where the wounded batman falls knocks over all the church pews and of course alerts vicky and the joker to the presence of someone there and he carries on because his crusade must not stop and there are high stakes and even though partially broken, Batman must continue. And this, this, even though they did add all this stuff, it does give it a finality. It does give it a, a certain, you know, a climactic feel. It is building to something. Uh, the Sam Hamm version, you know, basically has Batman go and confront Joker, and he's basically, you know, strapped a, a bomb to himself, and he's going to take both of them out. It's a lot darker but it's a lot more direct as well. Um, you know, it's just like a, a mano mano confrontation and you still have the helicopter and Batman basically uses, um, uses a swarm of bats to cause Joker to fall to his death. Um, I mean, it, it fits in tone with the rest of Ham's script and it makes sense. And it's a good ending when you, when you read it, but I, I, I do like what they brought to this, particularly with the grappling hook and the gargoyle weighing Jack down, Joker down and everything. Um, I like that Vicky's involved because it makes her more integral to the climax because in the Sam Ham version, she's kind of not there. Um, now, the Joker thugs up here, if you ever wondered why they're up here, it's in the novelization. I can't remember if it's in any of the script drafts, but they basically came up here to get a good view of of the uh, mayhem below. And they, you know, Joker's like, yeah, hey, what are you doing up here? And the novelization. And they're like, ah, oh, we wanted to see the whole whole show. And here we're cutting out the police. If you wondered why the police are not anywhere to be seen in the last half of the movie, there's a drop subplot where Joker drugged all of the coffee in the precinct. So all the police were out of commission until this point. So Gordon had to basically, you know, rouse everybody and to get, get the cops going again. <laughs> so that's why the police are nowhere to be found from a certain point in the movie, and especially not in the climax at all. That's another one of the many uh, drop subplots and drop scenes that was in the novel and in the scripts and, and so on and so forth. Again, that's kind of a sign of, you know, they were against a release date. And it was a big mammoth production, but also because you had all the different voices pushing and pulling the film in different ways. Um, but that does give it, again, an identity of its own. And I think what makes this film so magical is that it, it still manages to work and have its own identity and have a gravitas and still maintain doing a dark Batman that was the you know original intent. Um, again, I think it has to be stressed, this is much more you know 1939 Batman. So I don't have a problem with him you know, straight up killing everybody. Um, and having that very dark tone, and he's very nonverbal, doesn't say a lot, stays in the shadows, and and that fits perfectly with Burton bringing in the horror and expressionism um, tenets. So here we have, it can truly be said that I have a bat in my belfry. And of course, this is extremely dark and the darkest scenes of the film and, and returns are still pretty dark in the old video versions. But uh, this is where you can sort of get a glimpse at how dark the whole film is supposed to look. And again, playing around it, the, the usage of the police searchlights outside gives a nice contrast to everything and helps add necessary light to actually see what's going on because the rest is so dark. Now we have this sort of perverted touch of Joker and Vicky doing this tango waltz, you know, of, of death around while Batman's being beat up. 
again, this does have a lot of what Sam Hamm was putting across. A, a lot of his narrative drive is still in the film, but you know, it's it's been compounded and and massaged and pushed and pulled around by the producers and the studio and Tim Burton and then the rewrites that was uh, that uh, Warren Scarin did. Now we have the toughest of the of the three Joker goons. And if you ever wondered again why, you know, Batman is kind of getting beat up by a, a regular thug and the novelization, I think they give him a, he's a bit beefier and he's like a, a really good fighter, but also, you know, Batman's ostensibly beat up in this. He's got some cracked ribs already. He's not in the best state. <laughs> Plus it's, you know, extraordinarily hard to move in the bat suit. <laughs> I do love the whimsy that Jack has here and the whole climax. And and Vicky is suitably kind of totally out of her element, to beyond exhausted and everything. So it, it you know it does kind of make sense that she's just kind of like passing out at this point. <laughs> Again, I do think this whole climax, while it's not exactly explained, it does add some necessary. Closure. Uh, you have Batman and Joker con confronting each other directly. You have this fight sequence. You have Joker and Vicky. So you have you have the whimsical side. You have the darkness. You know he kills all of these guys, and it's a pretty you know brutal fight here. So it's it's a climax that has you know action and comedy and darkness, and it's it's a nice blending of all these. So. I'm amazed at how well this turns out, even though it doesn't necessarily make sense why, you know, they do all this on top of the tower. And that is a pure 1939 Batman move of just straight up killing the guy. Again, with Joker's perversion and complete turning around of all normalcy. <laughs> and everything changes when Batman's still alive. And here you actually see Vicky have her own intelligence where she decides to throw off Joker and she starts kissing him. And then there's this great little bit where she pulls the piece of lint out of her mouth, which is kind of weird. <laughs> I, don't, I, I guess that was an onset thing or, or a gag in one take, but I love that they kept it. It's just a really weird little thing. They cut it out of the first DVD for some reason. I think somebody thought it was an error, but I just love that. And she's like, really coming on to him, and his mouth is just hanging open. And she's like, I love purple. And it's just the perfect opening Batman needs to just... And he just says it bluntly before punching him in the face. And just straight up, I'm going to kill you and not even caring about the identity and Joker's, you made me. And then, of course, you, I made you, but you made me first. It's just no bones about it. It is direct to the point and, and brutal. It's in your face. And it does fit this movie, even if it's not, you know, pure 100% comic accurate Batman. And again, you see the the look in the eyes as they come out of shadow as Batman's eye, he, cowl moves through the darkness. Joker's still trying gags and nothing's working. But it still maintains a level of darkness so it doesn't go into parody. And Batman just does not stop. He just keeps going. And you know this isn't... This is literally coming. This is coming from the heart. You know, it's just like coming forward. Nothing is going to stop him. Joker is going to die <laughs> right here at this moment. And you can sense Joker has a level of desperation starting to creeping in. And again, right there, right before he punches him, you could see only the eyes are in light. But Joker has one last laugh. And here we see the gargoyle that's going to be his doom that I'm sure is designed to be 
thematically symbolic of Jack Napier turning into Joker and, of course, Batman being like a gargoyle himself as the first time you see him, he's a gargoyle uh, of sorts. And in the novelization, you know, it literally says, you know, there are a bunch of gargoyles and then suddenly one moves and it is Batman. <laughs> of course, he, he has that moment. He's totally playing it to the hilt. Uh, in the long shots, you see that the color of Joker's costume and everything is is a bit like, redder and they seem to have used a shot of that for the the effect shot when you see joker fall which is is the most dodgy shot in the film in terms of effects but i think because it looks so dodgy it seems really stylized so i really like the way that looks and i don't mind it looking a bit iffy because that makes it stick in your mind more and i just love the way that his face like freezes for a second yeah, it's this shot here you can see where it's like they took a freeze frame of that and had his face and then just, you know, dropped him there in an optical shot. And then the score comes back in, and I do love the way the wind blows off the hat and coat. It's almost symbolic in a way. It's foreshadowing. Of course, sometimes I kill, almost kill myself. And Batman, I love how he cold-bloodedly does this. It's like, well, what exactly is he trying to do here? Is he trying to just attach Joker to them? Or he is he actually aiming for the gargoyle? And again, it's this element of, you know, th there's an element of fate, but there's an element of Jack's own hand and that he could have escaped anyway had he just gone on. And then, of course, the gargoyle breaks off. I just love this setup. And then he's hanging on and Elfman's score just backs off, but is this sort of yearning building because it's like he's not going to escape this. And it, it adds a layer of suspense. It's very much like the ending of Saboteur when uh, when uh, the Statue of Liberty sequence when uh, Fry falls off and you have the breaking of the stitching on the coat. That's what it most reminds me of. And there's the optical shot everybody likes to complain about. But again, it's so kooky and weird. It, I, I, I go with it. I think it works. And now we have the last dangerous beat. And of course, Batman tries to fire his grappling gun, but Vicky won't stop moving. <laughs> and of course, you have to count on Batman's lucky grapple shots. And I, I love the fact that they just let it play out and they're just swinging quietly back and forth. <laughs> um, of course, the the um, rear projection shot there is you know not 100% convincing, but they don't hold it for very long. I do love the playing out there. This is probably the most Tim Burton-y flourish moment of the whole movie. The, the Joker still laughing in death and then the camera swirling down into a close-up with the police gathering around. It's a very creepy effect. It does stay with you. It really works. And, of course, it has to be Gordon who leans over and finds the laughing effect bag inside. Joker's last laugh, even in death. And, of course, we cut from there. Originally, we had the bit with Knox. We had Batman getting away. But I can understand why they cut it because it, you know, keeps everything moving. And we're right here in the last scene before the end credits with the reveal of the bat signal the uh, resolution of Knox and Vale. You see Knox's face is kind of bruised up and everything, so of course they didn't knock him off. And Vicky's response here, you know, she's going to keep Bruce's secret safe and she's going to, you know, see where that path, where that road goes. And, you know, she really does care about the guy, even if he is a bit of a goofball. <laughs> I think it's kind of funny how I was like, oh, we received a letter from Batman. <laughs> Just to get the mayor looking totally useless. I love the way Billy D. Williams just says, call me. And of course, this perfectly sets up the bat signal, which, of course, originally was inspired by uh, Knox creating an impromptu one in the uh, older drafts. And this gives us the cue, the bat signal in the sky, which is almost the perfect way to end any Batman movie. And then Vicki Vale here with her hair blowing in the wind, looking up at the bat signal is a very 
classic style image, almost you know straight out of a 1940s film, particularly a noir. And then Alfred standing by. Mr. Wayne would be a little late. Not a bit surprised. It's an ending they tried again in the original ending of Batman Forever. They tried something similar. It's it's a very classy way to, to end the film. And again, very much in keeping with something from the 30s and 40s. This is something that, you know, you, uh, th th this sort of classical nod is just something you don't get anymore in motion pictures today. And this leads to a very towering shot that goes up through in a very heroic rise. And it's, it's wiping across various buildings, of course, uh, if, you, if you look very closely. Uh, so you get this whole panoramic rise of Gotham culminating in Batman standing before the bat signal and... This is the most heroic that Elfman's score gets and culminates in the sort of church bells probably coming from the cathedral, which is really the, the final grace note of Batman 89 before trailing off into darkness and the end credits. And as it should, the Elfman theme does continue on giving you great exit music and a great post finale for the film uh end credit music is something that doesn't get discussed as often anymore but um you know i think the the first two batman films did a very good job at this of course then they see into you know the key song for each relationship for each respective film uh then in the later two films they pretty much switched over to using uh some of the excellent songs from the accompanying soundtracks but here it, it's it's a great you know exit from the film and the film's world and uh, I always watch through end credits but I always make sure to watch through the Batman end credits because they just it, it's it's what you need after going through that and you get to see all of the great names and uh, vast amount of work that went into making Batman eighty nine um, I'm just been trying to keep up as as much as I could I feel like I didn't even get to half of the stuff I wanted to get to but trying to get through a, a whole commentary and keep up with the film is, is very difficult so and here we have the last dramatic cue of Elfman's score before trailing out into Prince's Scandalous and I love the placement of this at the very end of the end credits um always seeing this film and ending in Scandalous is probably why it's become my favorite Prince song um of course Elfman we wove it in as the love theme of uh, Batman and Vicky, and I just love the way it works. It's a nice coda to the film. It does fit thematically again because it's worked in as the love theme, and uh, it's definitely my favorite of the Prince songs for Batman, and I think is one the most underrated. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just love the way this plays out over the end credits. It's, it's a relaxed vibe, and if you stayed long enough to watch all the end credits and you get through the Elfman music, it's, it's, a, nice, it's a nice way out. So this is bringing me to the end of my, com my solo commentary for Batman 89. If you made it this far, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully my babbling didn't sound too crazy. And again, uh, this is me just trying to put some of my many thoughts into words and keep up with the film as it goes along. Uh, definitely check out the Tim Burton commentary on the DVD and Blu-ray if you haven't already. And um, I will hopefully do a commentary on Batman Returns pretty soon. It really, the, the, the scandalous really does play you out really well, I think. And here we have the classic Dolby Stereo logo and Panavision Technicolor credit. And of course, Eastman stock originating. So once again, thanks for watching this with me. I hope you enjoyed it, maybe learned some interesting new stuff. And uh, humbly yours, this is the Motion Picture Analyst. <laughs>